Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Our Town. Thank you for joining us. To watch any of the Our Town podcast episodes, elnanews.com forward slash watch. To listen to any of the Our Town podcast episodes, you can find us on any podcast player, Spotify, Apple Podcast 246. Don't forget about our podcast hotline, 732 506 2600. This week's guest does not need much of an introduction. Rabbi Aaron Cutler has been definitely been an integral part of Lakewood's growth. So he's a fascinating individual, and uh, I'd like to thank Rabbi Cutler for being so gracious about coming on and having the conversation. Being that he grew up in Lakewood, he speaks about the Lakewood of old very fondly, about a time when if one wanted a kosher cupcake, that had to be brought in from Baltimore, Maryland. Rabbi Aaron Cutler, after getting married, was teaching in Asha Torah. He was very close with Avner Weinberg. We do not have a chance to speak about that part of his life, or he was then in a kail in South Folsburg. But in the late 90s, he was called back to help BMG, and he then did what he did and brought Bishmanjish Gavaya and Lakewood to where it is today. So he's a fasting individual, and we'll jump right into the conversation. Our episode sponsor, you'll hear about it soon. If you're going into Shaduchim or in Shaduchim or have a child, Going into or into Shaduchim, this one's for you. I'll catch you on the other side of the introduction. You are listening to Our Town, an LNN podcast. Meet the people who have transformed Lakewood from a small town into our town. I am your host, Mayor Dixtine. Today we would like to thank Aaron Cutler for joining us on the podcast. Welcome to Our Town. Thank you. So... There's uh, in Six Flags, there's something called a fast pass where you get to cut the line. I have a couple of questions that have a fast pass. We're going to cut the line, then we'll jump back. I'm very curious to hear about the Lakewood of old and you're growing up here in this town. I never followed sports. I was never into it. I, I never understood the enjoyment of it. I would see friends like watching a sport event and they would get excited emotionally to the point where they jump up and down and I never related to that until... As, I guess the last couple of years, two times, I was able to relate to that. One was watching the Trump debate against Hillary, where I was all riled up and excited every time Trump said something nice. The other time was during COVID, when I saw you on being some kind of interview. I don't remember if it was the Asbury Park Press, perhaps. You always very gracefully answered the questions and... Every time a question was posed, I'd get all nervous. What's he going to say? You know, it's going to be Yudh Hashem, and you just answer it and kind of put the ball back in the reporter's court. I'm wondering if this is something you always had. Is this something you work on? Well, thank you for reminding me of the APP interview. It actually was the APP who did the interview. They stood outside my house. At the time, No one, they weren't doing anything indoors. So it was a bitter cold winter day. And I actually had COVID at the time. Oh, but wow. we were doing social distancing, so I was quite far from the reporters, and there was no concern that I would in any way infect them because I was very far away from them. And they had some type of boom, special boom mic for that. But I didn't tell them that I had COVID because there were all these false allegations going around about religious Jews, how we were spreading disease, which there's nothing new to that. Throughout history, there's always been those types of allegations. So there were all these allegations, and they asked me if they can interview me. And I said, sure, I'm happy to do the interview. And I was just thinking to myself that, Hashem, I need a favor from you. I don't ask for favors. At least I try not to overtly ask for favors, just keep it to the normal tefillah. But Hashem, I need a favor. I'm going to do this interview. It's bitterly cold. I have COVID. I'm feeling okay, but I don't want to cough even once throughout the entire interview, because all I need is a few hundred thousand people to see some rabbi being interviewed, coughing away and thinking to themselves, look at these wow. Jews. But that really was an incredible time uh, during the COVID interview um, and the realization that um, we should reach out when there are those out there who misunderstand or who typecast the from communities across America and to talk to them. I remember very well there was a congress, a, uh, sorry, a, a councilman from Edison, New Jersey, an Indian gentleman, very, very nice gentleman, and he said something very nasty about the uh, religious community in COVID. And 
I called him up and I said, come, let me invite you down to Lakewood. So he came to Lakewood and I drove him around the town. This was at the height of the lockdowns when the entire world was shut. I mean, airports were empty, stores were empty. And I drove him around Lakewood and Lakewood looked like a ghost town. And I said, I'm, I, don't, I don't have anything to say here. I just want you to see what our community looks like. And he, he walked up to Shules. He saw signs. Shules were closed and all that. And he immediately did another interview in which he apologized oh. for his improper typecasting remarks. So do you get nervous? I mean, this is you're nervous not to cough. That's a lot of pressure for this yeah. interview. But otherwise, you get nervous by being interviewed. Let's say such a podcast. And I'm joking. Uh, you know, the media, world at large. Well, I think that we as religious Jews from Yiddin really have what to say. And we don't need to resort to the Donald Trumps of the world to share and express our values, the way we live, who we are. And I think if we're really proud of who we are, why should we be nervous about making our way through the world and expressing that to the world at large? And it's, it's similar. There are two types of people. There are only two types of people. One type is the guy who goes to the airport and is dominating chakras, and he tries to absolutely hide in the in the most forlorn corner where to daven. And the other person, he's not making a yell and a stink about it, but he's picking a spot where he can have kavana, and he's standing in his corner, and he's serving Hashem. And that type of yid really reflects the way we all should be, is get out there, we are who we are, we live with Hashem, we live with Torah, we live with our values, we live with our families, and we have nothing to be embarrassed about. We have nothing to be nervous about. And yes, there'll always be a handful of people. There'll always be those who misunderstand us. And the best response is to be who we are and to express the best values as we've been taught and as, as we live. So are you using those techniques you used on the Asbury Park Reporter right now? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know you very well. I do know the Dixie yeah. name is a great, a great name in Claudiusrael, but I'll get to know you a little bit. We'll see if I need to or not. Was this always your approach that this is who we are and we do what we do whether you like it or not? We're doing nothing wrong. It's not whether we whether you like it or not. It's you're going to like it. You're going to appreciate when you see who we are, when you see how we live. If you really get to know us, we are the most amazing community of people. We're not perfect. No community is perfect. No social system is perfect. And we take our share of hits along the way. But in the long run, the way we live is most remarkable. I'll never forget when Ramatasio went out on a great limb and did the internet asifa. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. So remember people, should be gazun people were, were very, very upset. And the criticism thrown at Lakewood was nonstop, was incessant. And I thought to myself, Mashkiach's making an incredible point. We can't let the world, with all of its defects and flaws and problems, into the lives of our children, into the lives of ourselves as adults. We know who we are. We, we know how we're meant to live. And let's live that way. And there was a lot of criticism about the Osifa. Today, looking back on it 15 years later or 10 years later, the entire world knows that unfiltered internet into your life is an unmitigated disaster. It destroys people's lives. It destroys their social structures. It destroys societies. It destroys their, their thinking patterns. It destroys their familial relationships. We've all, I'm sure, seen a cartoon or two of a family sitting around the table where everyone's on their smartphones and all. And, and TikTok and, and Instagram, how radically this has changed society. And I always thought it was never about the quote-unquote filth it's more about the social impact that you're letting the entire world unfiltered seep into your life. I mean, nobody would do that. We wouldn't let our child walk up to a stranger in some strange country and just talk to them, a young child, because you don't know what the other person will tell them or say or do. And why should we do that in our lives? But I remember that so distinctly how people were upset. And I thought to myself, in the long run, the entire world will come around and say, you know, that rabbi in Lakewood, he was right. And I've had many conversations with senators and congressmen about the effects of the Internet. There's, the, uh, there's a, a federal law that protects uh, Internet providers 
because they're seen only as a platform, not as a purveyor. So they can allow terrible things to be said. So one can go on the internet and say the worst things about another human being. And people do that and they have no liability for it whatsoever. And there's a, a, a law, a federal law that protects them. I think it's called the Communication with Decency Act or some type of Hello. acronym like that. And I've had many conversations with people in positions of authority about the problems. They all agree, they just don't know what to do about it. And we here in Lakewood, the Mashkiach, he stepped forward and the community rallied and 20,000 people gathered in defense of how we communicate and how we listen in defense of our values. So we really, we have nothing to be embarrassed about. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. Well, people take cheap shots at us. Of course, they'll take cheap shots at us. They always do, but you can't let it get you down. You can't let it in any way infringe upon your own sense of self. We're B'nai Taira. We have Rebbeim, we have Rabbanim, we have a Messiah, we have a Gedolim, we have an incredible society, we have incredible chesed. I'll never forget, Rich Roberts would always, you know, he, when visitors would come, he would take out the phone book and show the number of chesed organizations. We have to be proud, not we have to, we are proud of who we are. And it's no accident across America, volunteerism declined, community declined, a sense of bonds, of unity that pretty much disappeared. Uh, volunteer firefight organizations out the window. I heard once from Rabarin that when the federal government started to provide, I think it was food stamps or some other federal program, Rabarin said, people need it, true, but it's going to cause the decline of chesed because government is taking over the function that a community ordinarily did. A community should take care of each other, just, and we do. Yeah. And we're, we're really proud of that. Yeah, I was once speaking to a Haitian pastor out of Rockland County. He lived next to New Square, you know, and he saw Hatzalah there, and he was trying to put together his own Hatzalah, you know, volunteer organization. He was asking me for help. He said, you bought a, uh, an old ambulance for $50,000 halfway across the United States. Where do we start? What do we do? I'm like, you missed the boat. It's not, it's not, it's not how we do it. <laughs> Come up with a half a million dollars. Maybe Atzala started with an old ambulance or two, but certainly today, uh, I'll never forget, we once had a commissioner of health out in Lakewood, and there was way back, we were trying to get um, the Atzala paramedic unit authorized by the state of New Jersey. And the rules for paramedic units are very challenging. Uh, one of the reasons is they only allow one certificate of need per county, per region. They want to make sure that the people who are doing the paramedic work are highly qualified, and they don't want too many of them because they want what's called high utilization. High utilization means if you're going to go to a doctor and you need chastral knee surgery, you want to go to a guy who does it once a month, you want to go to a guy who does it 20 times a day, you want to go to the guy who's doing it every day because that doctor, he or she, has high utilization. So they're going to figure out how to do it best. And in medicine, that's a, that's a very important factor is high utilization. So the state did not want a new paramedic unit. They were fighting. They said, no, you can't do it. And we, in Lakewood, someone had Loya Lane who had a heart attack, and it would have made a difference in his life. Perhaps it was Rabbi Shimon Epstein's Zatzal or someone else. I forget who it was. And there was a drive, we need a paramedic unit. The difference is that EMTs, if I'm not mistaken, are not, not allowed to provide drugs, and, and paramedics are allowed to take what's called more interventional care. So we needed it. State was saying no. And um, Fred Jacobs, I think it was a Fred Jacobs, Commissioner of Health. I said, Fred, I want you to come down to Lakewood. Or it might have been a different commission. But Commissioner, I want you to come down to Lakewood, meet some of the fellas. So comes down to Lakewood and meets Hatzala member after Hatzala member. Now, you've seen what Hatzala members with some of these trucks look like. I'm not talking about the ambulances. I'm talking about the private vehicles. And these private vehicles with tens and tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And I said, Commissioner, who bought all this? Do you think the government bought this? He says, he says I don't know. I said, no. These were, do you think Hatzala bought it? No. This is the private individuals that purchased the equipment. And Avram Moshe Muller, I think he had a Jaws of Life, which was this device that helps open up car wrecks, and it's like $20,000. And he said, yeah, I, I bought this myself. And I wanted him to feel that sense of community, that sense of commitment to each other, that sense of volunteerism. And when he saw that, he became an ally and ultimately helped 
with an arrangement with Monarch, beat up on Monarch a little bit and got and got the Ed Solid Paramedic. What are your what are your first memories of let's say the, the actual town of Lakewood, Clifton Avenue? Obviously there wasn't Bagel Nash and all the other stores. What are your memories of that? Most of the downtown shops were owned by Yidden, or at least many of them who had survived the Holocaust. And the pain they had suffered was remarkable. And I think of uh, uh, particularly Ross Jewelers, who he lived on Sixth and Forest, and, and a number of they called them the Greeners, they were called in those days. Uh, they were new immigrants and all. And small shops, small businesses. It was a very warm and friendly pa- place. And when they would see a Jewish child walk down the street, you could feel their joy at seeing us. I think of the Walkoffs, and I think of the Wexelbaum's Five and Dime, and uh, uh, Gelbstein's Bakery, and uh, the Gertners, and store after store, you literally walk down. I knew all of the shopkeepers, or most of them, the Mays who ran Tiftoe, uh, uh, Ralph who ran Esterdale's Kosherama, these were little shops. There were no supermarkets in those days. But the warmth that they had to see a from child come down the block. And they were, by and large, they were not from. They had suffered terribly. They came over. They were in a new country. They had lost their social structures. And they had lost a lot. But the joy they had in seeing us was, was amazing. And we'd go into the stores, the five and dimes and the, the little shops. You know, you wanted to buy a punch ball or something. If you, if you saved up some money for a few weeks to buy a punch ball. And you know, you'd go in and, and they'd want to talk to you. They, they, they'd want to engage with you. Now, these were not shopkeeper assistants. These were the owners. The owners would sit in front of their shops. Uh, uh, Irving Bauer had a little shop. And uh, I, I don't remember all the folks. The... Um, uh, the Monasons who own Western Auto. I used to go into Western Auto if you needed to fix your bicycle tire. So you went into Western Auto to buy a patch kit. I mean, you didn't just get a new tire. You patched your tire. So you'd go in and buy a little kit. Just the joy they had in seeing us was a really made Lakewood a really special day in those days. And I want to mention that Rabbi Pesach Levovitz, he did an amazing job at taking these refugees and building a community who most of them were not from and making them feel part of something, and helping turn Lakewood into the place that it is. Do you remember the Mr. Gelbstein of Gelbsteins? I sure do, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and I remember the Sininskis. I'm, I was friendly with the Mark Sininskis, the Colonel of Racha, and, uh, and many others, so yeah. Is Gelbstein the only shop that's still around from back then? Um, I have to kind of think what, what's left. Well, r s Deli. So, you know, r s Deli was there. Uh, that was the only restaurant in town. Were they making good chopped liver back then? <laughs> you know, my mother, because she so appreciated r s how they kept true to, a, to, a, to an ideal, which is that we don't need to have everything in life. Um, so she would order every Friday from r and till the, till the day she was nifter. My mother was nifter on a Friday night. Every Friday, she had a standing order at R at R S Deli. She'd order, she'd have uh, kugels and uh, liver or whatever it was that she would order from there. Did you ever like I don't know go to a sleepaway camp and feel like an out of town Lakewood boy, being that no one else lived here? Oh, for sure. I mean, I had two Chamber Shabbos classmates in the whole Lakewood, so I, my class was a class of three, and then one moved to California, so it was a class of two. And at that point, it was no longer really viable. Now, we were not officially part of the Cheder. We just Rabbi Moshe Rubenstein would get us Rebbeim and all, but I had one classmate at, at one point in time, other points in time. I had two, and sometimes they would kind of merge our classes and all. And I'll never forget, I went to Brooklyn to my grandmother, to Barnes Rebetzin for a Shabbos, and there was a Pirche Shabbos afternoon, and I came back to my sister, and I said to my sister, I said, Bela I, I, I think there's this international convention of all the Jews of the world, all the Yidden of the world, because there must have been 50, 60 kids there. I don't think I had seen that many. I actually did go to summer camp. I went to, a, I went to Camp Agoda, so also also felt like I was at this international crossroads conference of all the world Yiddish guy together. But certainly we felt like the out-of-towners. As a, as a way of illustration, so you could not really get kosher cupcakes in Lakewood. Because you can get bread, um, because bread would last a few days, and there would be a run of kosher bread from, uh, I guess it was Gelbstein's. It was Gelbstein's, but there were no, you couldn't get a kosher cupcake. And uh, we had a 
cousin uh, who would come from Baltimore and he would bring us cupcakes. And we felt like our entire world had lit up. It was like this this remarkable delicacy. You could actually get a kosher. That's great that Baltimore was in town and Baltimore Lakewood was out of town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. At what point did you feel that things, I mean, obviously in like the 2000s, things really ramped up, but at what, what point was it no longer out of town? Well, the, uh, what to me, always the anecdote that describes the turning point was when I mentioned Rabbi Shimon Epstein, there's a friend of Levracha before, but uh, my, Rabbi Shimon Epstein was building a house on, on 6th Street, and not far, like two or three houses down from the yeshiva. And I think he was the first one, him, maybe a Bainish Parnas, a couple of Hever wanted, my father would call them also, Sav of Lamishka and Yachanu. They wanted to be near the, near the yeshiva. He's building a house, and if you look at the house today, I don't think that there's any new home being built in Lakewood of that size and type and uh, simplicity. And I, I think that most homes are far nicer, certainly in the amenities and certainly in the size of new homes and all. But anyway, he was building a house, and my father was walking down the block. My father was very close to Reb Shimon. They, Reb Shimon always down in the yeshiva. They had a special relationship, and he sees the building a house. So my father says to him in Yiddish, Reb Shimon, vifl shlof simmers. How many bedrooms? So I think he said finif, which would be five bedrooms. You can ask Yitzchak Aryeh or Butchie how many there actually are. This Sunday night, we're dropping an episode with Butch Epstein. So. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, he says five. And my father takes a step back. Five means you're obviously you're going to have a, a large family while you're living in Lakewood. You're not moving out. He says, oh, yeah, bliped, you're staying. And Shimon had become a butcher in Freehold. So it was like it was like a, a shock move for him. Oh, yeah, bliped, you're staying in Lakewood. Um, but, um, you know, as a kid, you, we began to see um, you know, stores open, shops open, people stay. Uh, but you don't really think about these things because you, you don't have a frame of reference when you're young. And it was always a sense that this is where we live, this is our place. And uh, although every now and then we'd get beaten up or cursed out by some uh, some local yokels who didn't know who we are, who thought they knew who we were, um, it really a beautiful place to live, and it still is. Was there a lot of opposition, like the town against the yeshiva? So there were two people who really... Uh, transformative human beings in terms of what they did for the town. Uh, one was a, a Jewish gentleman named George Buckwald, uh, all of us shall have. George Buckwald was a Republican, and he was Jewish, and he embraced the yeshiva community. And what he did for the yeshiva community was unimaginable uh, because no one else, they didn't know who we were really. And uh, I'll go back in history in a second, but he deserves special mention. Uh, his son Adam should be well, a uh, beautiful young firm man. Uh, and uh, George was, was one of the first. The other is my very dear friend and mentor, uh, Joe Buckaloo, who is a uh, Bliai and Hara in his 90s. He should live, Mirza Shem, 220 and beyond. But Joe Buckaloo was the mayor in the 60s or 70s. And he really embraced the community. And he's never let it go from his heart. A special, special human being. So there were leaders like that who were. Uh, Joe Buckle was an Irish, uh, Irish Catholic gentleman. He was a waiter at uh, Laurel and the Pines as a kid, and then he became a police officer, and he then became the mayor of Lakewood. He went on to build the Garden State Parkway. If you've driven on it, you might want to say thank you to to, uh, to Joe. Uh, if you you mentioned you don't follow sports, neither do I. But if you did and you ever went to the stadium to the Meadowlands, he was chairman of the Sports and Exposition Authority, so he built that stadium. Uh, incredible human being, and uh, although he lives nearby in Brick, uh, his heart. Is in, it's always been in Lakewood. He used to live right right next to the golf course uh, down off of Hope Road. And uh, he really uh, went out of his way to ensure a warm and friendly welcome. So it wasn't always easy. Um, but by and large, there were human beings like that. The great human beings who are assured a place in Shemayim for what they did. And there were many of them. Uh, I think of Mike Levin. Should be well. Mike Levin uh, lives down in Florida. He was a mayor also in the in the 70s or 80s. Um, you have to remember, and this is the history. I think it's important for the newer listeners to know. Lakewood was a Jewish town, and uh, when the yeshiva started in Lakewood, there were 200 hotels. 50 of them were kosher hotels. Rabaran 
chose this out of New York City where there were no distractions. But Lakewood had 200 hotels. It was the Vegas, the Catskill, Borscht Belt, the Atlantic City in its heyday of its day. And there were plenty of distractions uh, with shows, night show, uh, nightlife, and all types of uh, things. One could go to a comedy club, dances, and all those other types of things. So, but it was a very Jewish town. It had become very Jewish in the 30s and 40s. And uh, my memories, of course, were these old hotels being knocked down as, as, as the town changed. But it had a very, very Jewish flavor to it. Why was Lakewood chosen to be a winter resort? What, what? Uh, it was about an hour and a half, two hours from New York City in those days. Um, I remember when Route 9 was dualized in Howell, so Route 9 used to be a two-lane road. Uh, it was pretty close to New York. It has a very, very good climate. There was a beautiful lake. And the wealthy, I'm talking about the super wealthy, the Goulds, the Rockefellers, they all had estates here. And Lake was filled with these estates of these very super, super wealthy families before, probably before Newport, Rhode Island, uh, before Saratoga. This was a very accessible winter resort. And the homes were beautiful. Uh, some of my friends lived in some of those homes. The Abadis, uh, Chaim Abadi and uh, Avromi and Aroni and the Abadi family, Rebitzik Abadi should be because they lived on Second Street, one of these old, in the Dr. Uh, Dr. Zinken mansion. Uh, so uh, we used to go to these houses. They, they were like, they were magnificent with the old woodwork and the high ceilings and coffered ceilings and all. But uh, Lakewood was an interesting place. So, yeah, I'm told that the, um, back in the day, probably when you were growing up, there were a lot of gangs in town and like certain areas of the town where you, you just didn't walk. So was it like a winter resort? Was I don't it? I think there were gangs. Well, I don't remember there were places we didn't walk. I mean, there were neighborhoods. Like in any city or small town, there were ethnic neighborhoods. But I don't think we really felt uncomfortable going anywhere. I don't remember any gangs. Uh, people are, by and large, respectful. Um, I do remember when the hippies uh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, so there was a small motorcycle gang that kind of occupied the corner of Fifth and, Fifth and Private Way. So, you know, they're like let's, let's, <laughs> some guys hanging out. I don't know if they were uh, from one of the gangs or not, but I, I, I never had that impression. So Herb Aaron was based out of Brooklyn, and he would come to Lakewood. Well, it was based out of Manhattan, actually. Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, originally. Later, he right. moved to Brooklyn. And he would come to Lakewood Thursday and say, sure, Thursday, Friday shop is Sunday, and go back Sunday. Was that for fundraising purposes? Uh, he was in much demand by Kal Yisrael. And when he started the yeshiva, the Vadat Salah was still fully was in the heart of the war. So he was very uh, focused on the Vadat Sala. And then he was focused on Chinachat Smoyen Eretz Yisrael and Torah Messiah and building around the world. So he never he never ended up moving here. Was there ever a care of effort for like locally in Lakewood by Bishman Um I think Kirov is kind of a misnomer or it's a misunderstood word. So uh, if you build a day school for kids of parents who are not, not religious or not, that's Kirov. Yes. Um, Shalom Torah Centers was certainly started out of Lakewood. And uh, my father drove the founding of Baragaila. Rebara drove the founding of Oitzo Tire in France, uh, Argentina, Shuva Bonham. So these were all... I don't know if you would call them Kirov or not, because kind of Kirov has this like fixed identity. And I think what happened is, as the Frum community grew, it began to look inward naturally to resolving its own needs, because that always happens. You have so many of your own needs. So Kirov kind of became this professional activity. I think the lines were a little more blurred in those days. I don't think it was looked at as this professional thing. It was part of how you lived, was you interacted, and you connected, and you learned with people, and... Uh, um, you help them reconnect, Asha. Wow. So that was, uh, yeah, through, through your, I don't know, at some point you left Lakewood. How big was the yeshiva when... Uh, well, when, when, when my father was Nifta, there were about, uh, about 800. And uh, he, I, I like to think he was one of the most successful people in the history of the world, it, and, and certainly in the history of Kuala Yisrael, which by definition makes it in the history of the world. And I say that because when Ravarin was Nifta, Tarvadas, Mir, uh, Ner Yisrael, Tells, uh, they all were about the same size or similar size. And when my father was Nifter, 20 years later, the Lakewood had 
exploded to like 800. And the other yeshivas had also grown, but certainly not in anywhere on the same trajectory. And that trajectory has kept, to this day, Kanaidahara with over 8,000. So he set the yeshiva on that path. And he had a unique model for learning. He felt that every, every bacher was an adult and should be related to as an adult and should get to choose his own mahalach halimut. He didn't want to imprint on them, let's call it my shear, my mahalach halimut. He wanted them to continue with their own mahalach halimut. And he wanted the model to be very, very much chabura based or that wasn't as a formal and official today. Uh, there were chaburas in the yeshiva, and he, he wanted people to be engaged in the chabura system. Uh, I'll never forget Rabbi Yossel Ryman. So Rabbi Yossel Ryman was my uh, Rosh Chabura, and my father uh, passed by one day, and we were going into a little chabura room. To say, he was going to say a chabura. And my father said, Rabbi Yossel, I say every Thursday. My father says, not you, the oilam. We were bachram. And like, he says, the oilam has to say. You have to have the oilam say. So it's, like, it's a whole different model of learning than what a lot of the other yeshivas did. And he said it as a, in a sense, not that there's higher and lower, but on a distinct model where you're meant to be self-motivated, you're meant to be self-driven, and we're going to give you a lot of room to do that. And we obviously realize that if you allow that model there will be some who are not motivated. But in the long run, it's a far more effective model for producing Talmud HaChamim than it is with a tighter, sheer based daily blotcher type of model. So unlike other yeshivas, we don't have to say names. He didn't set it up with a blotcher and uh, very, very much with independence and learning. And that then welcomed a lot of different Bahram and Yungalite from different places. So there were foreigners, there were Englishmen, there were uh, Antwerpenes, there were Bachram from Vienna, from uh, Latin America, from uh, Mexico, from all these different types of places. Chesidim, Litvaks, Ashkenazim, Sephardim, all in one mix. The common denominator was you came here to learn. And it did require you to be motivated. A lot of people come in, maybe they weren't so motivated. For some of those, they would then become very motivated. But by and large, the, the model carried for the vast majority where it's a highly motivated place. And by the way, that is the secret of the success of Lakewood. And if permit me to digress for a moment, but I, I don't know, Leonor, how many kids there are in the Mises today in Lakewood. But let's assume it's north of 40,000. So if 25 years ago, somebody would have said to you, Mayor, we have to build schools for 45,000 kids, 50,000 kids. We have to hire Manalim, Moros, Rebbeim, build campuses, acquire land, set up chinuch systems, do the whole thing of building Meistus. So you probably would have said, okay, let's make a committee. And maybe you would have gone to one of the old organizations. And so let's make a committee, let's plan it out, let's raise money, let's develop training programs, let's do all these things we need to do centrally to do it. The reality is none of that happened. Some of it happened. Shiva Bar Hashem has run uh, through the work of the great Reblazer Goldstein and Reb David Bernstein Tarmasara, a Rebbeim training program for many years. But by and large, Yengaman sitting in Yeshiva, he realizes there's not enough space. We need a school. He could be a Zevi Has, he could be a Yoi Notice, he could be a Yankee Robinson. And he gets up, he could be a Menachem Spiegel and say, okay, I'm going to go out and build a Maisen. Without two pennies in their pocket, they went out there, they built these Maisens. A Shleim Chaim Kanarik in his day. I mean, Shleim Chaim Kanarik is an Israeli. He, didn't, he came here with nothing. And, and one after another, a tremendous entrepreneurial drive, which started with the attraction of those people with self-initiative because of the learning model, then in building Maistus, and now, of course, you see it in the business world where Lakewood has a tremendous, an incredible entrepreneurial spirit. But it all comes out, I believe, to Reb Schneer's decision of how to build the model of the yeshiva, not around a blot shear, not around coddling or, 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 or being too controlling in any way of the Bachram and the Yungalite, but giving them 
a tremendous amount of freedom. And if any of the older Lakewood Talmudim listen to this podcast who were around in those days, they will know exactly what I'm talking about. The Louis Friedmans of the world. They, they know exactly the Simcha backs, how, how the yeshiva was set up. And that is why it was so successful, because of the freedom that Rabbi Schneer wanted the Talmudim to have. Let me just take a minute here to talk about our sponsor, the Nasi Project. Are you going into Shaduchim or currently in Shaduchim? Well, the Nasi Project has a phenomenal book called Navigating Shaduchim, effectively, efficiently, and gracefully. So this is meant for everybody who wants to go through Shaduchim with clarity. This is for you. This is also for parents who have children going into Shaduchim or currently Shaduchim. That way you can say no or yes with clarity. Um, so don't go through this alone. Don't go in having to learn from your mistakes. Go in with a little bit of education, which will go a long way. Um, besides for a book, they also have a class, a sheer on their website, which was listened to and approved by Bishmuel Kamenetsky and her Pesach Krohn. So definitely go and check that out, which will benefit you greatly or your child greatly. You can check it out on their website at nasishidduch.com, N-A-S-I-S-H-I-D-D-U-C-H.com. Check that out. But now, back to the episode. On that note, not really the yeshiva, but the town, do you think now that there are different issues we may have because the town just evolved on its own rather than being built with foresight and structure? Well, central planning uh, was discredited when the communists tried it. In Goss plan, they had the five-year plans. My father certainly knew about that, as did Ravarin. They, they, had, they had lived through the, the, the height of the communist days. Um, so all those central plannings, they don't really work. They don't work in life. They don't work in communities. They don't work in business. Uh, what works is really inspired people. And every social system, every community will have problems. The best way to resolve those problems is through an entrepreneurial spirit where the people want to go ahead and resolve it. And the people will resolve those problems. New ones will crop up. That's part of the cycle of life. But we're really blessed to have that here. At what point was, was uh, BMG officially an accredited college with the state? Uh, under my father's day in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, uh, they, the yeshiva went for accreditation to be registered as a, as a licensed and accredited institution of higher education. And um, yeshiva has been accredited since then. Baruch Hashem. So if I did my research correctly, you, you've... I don't know at what point you left Lakewood, but you were married in Eretz Yisrael and then South Fallsburg, right? At one point, I'm telling you if this is correct, or you can just say the story, you were kind of called back here because the yeshiva was in a situation where they needed more help. Well, the yeshiva was growing rapidly, and the community was growing rapidly. So, uh, you know, one of the advantages of the family model of, uh, of, of leadership is that, I mean, the Chassidim have it, and many Litvaks have it, and many other places have it, is that... Uh, it really encourages people to do things that they might not have done otherwise, and it pushes them to uh, to undertake roles that they might have done other things. So for me, I, I don't I don't know if I wasn't a family member if I would have decided that yeah I really want to come here and 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 undertake the job that I undertook. The reality of Lakewood growing rapidly and it needed more uh, resources. And Baruch Hashem, Lakewood continues to grow rapidly, and it should always need more resources. Do you remember that? I don't know if it was a phone call or that takufa of uh, you know them calling you up saying uh, SOS. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't think it was an SOS. I mean, it, you know, institutions and communities they evolve. I don't mean that in a negative sense. They're always changing and evolving, and uh, you look at things in new ways all the time. And uh, I think it had grown to a point where. You needed somebody to do a central role, which was not just the fundraiser or the accountant or the government person in the yeshiva. Uh, I was really uh, benched that the most incredible team. I think of uh, uh, Rebleza Cooperman in the financial office. He should be gazant. I mean, what a powerhouse, what a brilliant man, and what a capable person. And the same was true in the fundraising arena. 
Um, shout out to Mordechai Hershkowitz, who was, he was a young guy, then he's still a young guy, but uh, the most talented people. And uh, Rabbi Yaakov Weisberg, who kind of love Rachel Rav Usher Katz, running the other elements. Rabbi Ksil Weinstein, who was just Nifter. I mean, these were for the most talented human beings to have ever walked the face of this earth. They were there, they were doing their jobs. Yeshiva was growing rapidly. The town was growing rapidly. So the idea that you'd have kind of the generalist, not the specialist, was, really was a new idea. And small institutions might not do that. But when you reach a certain size, you say, hey, we really we, we need to have that generalist there who's going to kind of be the, the nudgy glue that kind of keeps everybody together. Were there other candidates at that time for the job? Or was it, no, we need you to come here? I, I don't think it was a matter of candidates. It was more of an idea that, that we need to have more central coordination and the responsibilities of keeping the, the moisid in a coordinated way. Uh, was, was a new one. I mean, I don't think other yeshivas had someone in that role either. Um, so the yeshiva wanted to have someone in that role. And uh, again, they had the most talented. I want to reiterate this. They're all, uh, the living ones are dear friends of mine and those who are, who are not uh, were the most incredible people. From the secretaries of Rabbi Friedowitzer, uh, Mr. Friedowitzer in the office, Zechariah Levracha, or Mayor Wasolsky, Zechariah Levracha, most talented people, uh, men and women alike. Uh, my sister, Rabbi Tsinkrapenya, and uh, uh, Mrs. Israelowitz in the New York office. I don't, an assembly of talent you can't imagine. But you do reach a point where you say, we need that central coordination. What was the most pressing issue at that time? What was the first? moves, acts that you did when coming back? Like with- I think engaging more friends when you're really busy. Um, sometimes you neglect some of your key people because you're so busy functionally right. having to accomplish the functions you need to accomplish. So they you work, think, work in the business or on the business? Yeah, you right. think of it, think of it La Havdal, like a supermarket. So a supermarket could spend all of its time uh, bringing in product, placing product, selling product, operationally, very engaged operationally. And then it needs a financing, and it doesn't really have the banks that we don't even know who you are. Or it needs investment, and the investor community says, well, we have no idea who you are. So spending time on that, on those relationships, they're not immediately operational, so they don't relate to a functional area, but they relate to a macro area, or the, the macro. And that takes someone who doesn't have the daily functional responsibilities. So I brought in someone with the help of Ramona Hershkowitz to run tuition. We broke out tuition from fundraising. That was a seminal moment for me because revenue had been one department. We said, no, we're going to make revenue two departments. We're going to have fundraising, we're going to have tuition. We then broke out into three departments, fundraising, tuition, and, uh, and, and grants. So those were moments of taking the moisid to where it needed to go to recruiting new people and getting that job done. So seeing that big picture and staying very focused on that big picture. So uh, would you have the know-how about a, a company structure or organization structure? Um, I understand, if I'm correct, that you don't have, at that time, at least like a college education or prior real business experience. You were in Kyle. Oh, I still don't have it. I'm really, I'm a, I, I, was a, I was a yeshiva dropout, so... Uh, um, I remember the first test I took in my life, pretty much, since maybe second grade, was when uh, we were doing some uh, some testing uh, in the yeshiva, some ap- some uh, skills and aptitude testing, and I was like thinking, "Wow, it's like my first test." And I'm like, <laughs> I was literally sitting at this table, and I had like I had like a time twenty minute run to solve all these all these math questions, and then all these uh, strategic questions, and I, like I was I was really taking a test. Um, look. I, I saw my father. Um, I saw how he did things. I, Baruch Hashem, got to see my brother, the great Rabbi Malkiel, the great Rabbi Rucham, the great Rabbi Dov, the great Rabbi Sral, and a lot of mentors around me of really special people who were willing to give me time and energy for the, the many, many things I did not know. And I really didn't know much. I'll, I'll cite an anecdote for you. So I'd never done construction. Baruch Hashem, I've done a little bit of construction since, but I've never done construction. So we were planning a new building, and the builder said it's going to take X amount of time. 
and uh, we needed a temporary solution where we were going to put the dining room. So I had this plan. Shlomo Chaim Kinnarik had offered me a building. Incredible human being. He had a building. He owned it on Route 9. He said, Aaron, you take the building. You need it, you take it. Like, it was totally selfless. So Shlomo Chaim offered the building. How are we going to get the Talmudim from the yeshiva to the building? We're going to get buses and run buses, figure out some solution for breakfast, but lunch and supper. Twice a day, we would bust the Talmudim. And the builder said eight months. For eight months, it was seen as a potentially reasonable solution. And uh, Yossi Reader says to me, the building's not going to take eight months. I said, Yossi, what are you talking about? The builder says eight months. He says, Aaron, have you ever built a building before? I said, no. He says, well, let me tell you, it's not going to take eight months. It did not take eight months. So it's a beautiful building, but it took a lot more than eight months. So we figured out a solution in the yeshiva itself. Instead of busing people twice a day for two years, uh, we took the basement of the 6th Street of Martin Klein dormitory and converted that into a temporary kitchen and dining room. But you learn, and if you surround yourself with good people, uh, you have a lot of good people to learn from. And uh, Gedalia Weinberger, Shimmy Glick, uh, Howard Friedman, many, many other mentors along the way, too numerous to mention. Uh, you really, you can learn what you need to learn. You know, when Rabbi Aaron was starting BMG or running BMG, uh, not everyone was like pro kill at that time, right? The people were pro-college and he, this was something new and different. Did you feel any of that left over when you got involved in Lakewood? Yeah, I think uh, some people would, uh, yeah, I'd get, I'd, get, I'd get quite a bit of that where people didn't really understand it. Um, and that required that we then learn to articulate the value of what we're doing and the why. I'll never forget this. I was once having a uh, discussion with a, a potential supporter, and he says, there are too many guys in Kyle. I said, well, how do you measure that? Because he was that type of guy you could have. That's, you know, everyone has a different way you respond. <laughs> he said, well, there's just too many. I said, well, how do you measure that? He said, I don't know. You tell me how to measure it. I said, look, I believe there are more Jews named Goldberg studying postmodern art in secular university than there are Jung Light learning in Kyle. I was kidding with him. Probably not. <laughs> but maybe there were. So I said, the you know, idea. at the point that there are more in Kyle than there are Goldberg studying postmodern art in second university. That's when maybe we can have this conversation. But right now, it's too early to have the conversation. And he laughed because he recognized the point is that you need a lot of tire in cholesterol, a lot of tire. And we need as much tire as we can get. To say that you have too much tire, maybe you could be concerned that as people falsely were, there'd be no money. Uh, that all these worries because they were not throwing the burden on Hashem, shlach yahavcha on Hashem, but let Hashem carry your burden. They weren't doing that. They were too worried about it. But it was coming from a good place. But I'll never forget that conversation, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we need more. What about building relationships with local government? What was that like? Um, the American political system is the probably the single best one uh, created in the last few thousand years. It's built on the Roman model and the uh, originally on the Greek model. The Roman model actually was a pretty good one. Are you sure you didn't go to college? No, I didn't. Go. You know too much. No, no. <laughs> the Rome had a Senate, and uh, um, so it's built on a, on a model really of collaboration and cooperation. It breaks down at times, but the underlying model is one of collaboration, cooperation, and compromise. And the people who are active in politics, they need to build consensus. They need to build collaboration. They need to build compromise. So they want it, they seek allies. And the greater the coalition that you can create, the stronger you get. That's why America is only two political parties, two main political parties. Ross Perot notwithstanding and Rand Paul, that third party model never really took off. The socialists of America type of thing. It kind of forces you into because it's not a parliamentary system. It's a, uh, it, it's a, se- a, a, a division of power, but it's a senatorial and congressional system. So it forces you into, into those types of coalitions and collaborations. So the people who are elected to office, intuitively they get that, and they want to build as strong of a coalition as they can. So their doors are always open to you. They say, hey, come on in. Let's talk. And 
we'll amend our platform to accommodate your needs if you support us. So it's not a quid pro quo, it's the creation of a coalition. Uh, not to use George, George Bush's coalition of the willing, but the, the idea that you're going to work with others to get to your goals uh, is ingrained in the American political system. It's not in the parliamentary system, uh, but it is here. So you put on a, a hat of advocacy of real estate and development and business, just business function. You, you learned a whole lot on the job. Did you ever... You ever sit back and wonder what you would have done had you would have, you know, in the workforce, had you would have not joined BMG? Well, you know, no man knows his path. Uh, yeah. We only know where we are. Uh, I think I know what I would have done, but no man really knows where he would have landed up. Would you share with us what you think you would have done? Uh, there are a lot of beautiful things one can do in life. So uh, uh, the, the uh, burden of administration is, is a great one. Because it's constant. I used to joke when I came to the yeshiva that uh, the job here was to fix the engines on the airplane. However, the airplane is flying while we need to fix it. And we keep adding passengers midair. So uh, exactly. it was a lot, a lot of work, and it, it's a burden. So I don't know that I just willingly would have woken up one day and said, hey, this is really what I want to do. Um, but uh, certainly exhilarating to do it and certainly very rewarding both obviously, and uh, hopefully in Shabayim, if one's Kavanos are right, but down here on Earth, too, very rewarding. Are there any particular time over your 26-year um, BMG that was, like, particularly rough or particularly stressful? Or... Well, I remember in 08, so 08, there were a few crises along the way, but 08 was a, was a relatively uh, significant one for a coddled generation who has never experienced real suffering and pain, so relative to the state of the union, state of the people of America, it was a pretty rough one. I remember we were having a conversation, and the conversation in the office went like this. Look, we survived the communist revolution when the yeshiva fled from Slitz to Kletsk. The communists then came into Kletsk, so we survived the exile to Vilna. We had to run away from Vilna because they were taking over Vilna, so the yeshiva had to run to Yanova and the other villages around there. With The yeshiva then had to flee the Nazis. Um, and... During that time, there was also the Great Depression. 1929, the yeshiva was open through the Great Depression. And we have some letters from Rebaran that I treasure that talk about there being no bread in the yeshiva and the wow. bakers being unwilling to extend credit for bread. And then, and we survived the 60s and, and all that. So the blips we face today are relatively small. And uh, if you keep that perspective, there will be times when a little tougher, but that's okay. Did you ever think of like just let's just slow down the growth for two years so we could breathe? <laughs> um, my father had had a few jokes about that. He would use when people would ask that. So one of them was uh, I'll never forget this. As a kid, we were walking up private way to the yeshiva, and we met. I think it was Mr. Zagorn who owned an oil company, and he was close to my father, the Zagorn family, and and the yeshiva had a very special relationship. Um, and there were two Zagorans, one on 6th, one on 7th, a very special family. Um, still around, Janet Zagoran, a wonderful person, dear friend of the yeshiva. And Mr. Zagoran said to my father, it must have been in Yiddish, how many Talmidim do you have? And my father probably said, whatever, 400, whatever it was. And he goes, as I feel, so many. And my father jokingly said, in Vifel Hut, ir in Geschäft, you know, you kid around with them. And he says the number. I say, oh, it's too full. I say, it's too bad. <laughs> um, it, look, this is this is eternity, and uh, you never really get enough. Um, Ramakil always says over. Um, I forget who it was who uh, came to the yeshiva, and uh, he heard from my father the budget, and he said like, this is nishkenuk. It's not enough. Uh, it's just not enough. Like your budget's not big enough. You know so. There's two attitudes. The guy comes in and says, hey, it's too much, it's this, it's that. And then there's those who say, wow, no, this is not enough. Wow. So there's, there's uh, what is it, 8 plus billion people in the world. There's maybe 13 to 15 million Yidin, depending on, uh, on whose stats you use. And maybe a million are from, and a few hundred thousand learning in yeshivas. No, it's not enough. Is there a, so there's no number, like a cap, 10,000. There's no, you're saying, just the more the merrier, and that's it. It's not the more the merrier. You want to make sure that the yeshiva is a place that, that uh, 
builds Talmud Chacham as it does. And the more we can enable Talmudim to make themselves into Talmud Chacham, uh, the better off the world is. Certainly the better off Kla Yisrael is, but the better off the entire world is. It is a blessing for the world. And yeah. there's never too much bracha. For sure. Were there ever like uh, certain plans which you were working on which didn't pan out? Like, uh, that would be interesting, like, I don't know, move oh, BMG the, out of Lakewood? Or all, out of no, all the time. I mean, I wanted to buy David Seabag, who was uh, in contract or owned at the, at the lake. The, uh, not It's not Laisha. It's on the lake uh, at Madison and North Lake Drive. Um, the motel that's now the assisted living. And, Lakewood Courtyard. Yeah, Lakewood Courtyard. And, uh, you know, we had the ability to get it. And uh, I brought it up. And Rav Nussin said it's too far from the yeshiva. And I passed on it, you know. So I used to think I would walk by. I see the beautiful job David did there. David was going to give it away pretty much, you know. And it's like... Like, wow, we could have had that. But you know what? It does, it's not what matters. Right. Yeah, Meshkir wanted to keep the yeshiva together. And that feeling that the yeshiva is together as one, you know, different tukufas. I'm sure if it were today, they would have, the yeshivas and Meshkir would say, grab it. But back then, it was, you know, the yeshiva was kind of together. And it was a sense that it would separate the yeshiva a little bit. I was speaking with Mr. Jack Mueller. He said, if I had to guess, if during, like, you know, during traffic hours of the day, when Route 9 is a little congested, if if Aaron and Rav Nussin were in a car together, they'd get out and dance on Route 9 in the traffic. They'd be so excited. Did Jack say that? <laughs> he did. Yeah, because I actually was talking to Jack yesterday and schmoozing with him, and I said I was just driving through Lake when I said Jack just. You know, we always we always reminisce about it. Look at this, and he said it's not enough. It's not enough. We need more Yidden. We need more people. Yeah. Wow. I, I, if we can talk about, um, I'm, I'm told that you have a hobby for traveling, and uh, yeah, is there any? What's the most exotic place you've been to? I've probably been near the North Pole, uh, spent Shabbos at the foot of a glacier camping out. Oh, well. that's pretty exotic, yeah. I'm wondering if you get your your traveling uh, hobbies like uh, Rabban used to travel a lot. <laughs> well, we do that too a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Not as not like Rabban, but a little bit. Very nice. But if you spend Shabbos at the foot of a glacier, you can uh, you can daven like a Breslov and you have no one to be embarrassed about. Because yeah. you just, it's just you and Hashem out there. Was it like a big relief when you took off the BMG hat? Like, Well, I still wear, the, I still wear my BMG hat. Uh, yeah. But uh, the, the, the daily pressure of 24-7, you know, a budget never goes away. This is a rule of life. A budget never goes away. And... If you're growing, it really will never go away. Um, so uh, it's a lot of stress, but it's good stress. I mean, stress, stress is actually healthy for you. It's a good thing. Uh, too much stress. <laughs> I guess everything with a balance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was with, um, were you involved with building Basil Yahoo? I remember they were in trailers for like years. Yeah, one day Mordecai <laughs> Hershkowitz came into my office. He says to me, yeah, I don't understand what you're doing. Uh, I said, Mordecai, what? what What's on your mind? He says, I don't understand you. He says, come, come with me. So I walk outside, and we walk through all of the newer buildings, and then we walk into Basel. He takes me to Basel, y'all. And he says, sit down here. So I sit down in the back of the base matters there, and he says, look at this. He says, we're building a new building here. He says, this, they're the, they're the, they're the forlorn, the lost ones of the yeshiva because the Baron building we redid, we redid the Bendai building, the 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 uh, Ma'in Zafir, the the, the uh, that Baron building we read that we built Beis Shalom, Beis Ali, uh, Beis Aaron. Uh, we I bought Forest and Carry Bate Medrash with the help of Dove Gluck and Ralph Zucker. We bought those and made beautiful Bate Medrash there. And there's still an island left in Beis Leo. Now they were pretty happy, but. Um, it really was time for it to go. So uh, we go back to the office and we right away draw plans. Basically all it was, guess how many square feet? Uh, it was 9,000 square feet. Oh, yeah. So um, we drew up a plan for a replacement, this is how plans go, a replacement of the 9,000 square foot building with a nice basic cinder block, uh, nicely decorated building. And then we said, okay, but the sheep is gonna grow. so. Uh, we said, okay, let's make it 15,000. So 
we, we drew up plans for 15,000. And then we drew up plans 15,000 where we could add on on the back. Uh, the building is 60,000 plus so uh, square feet. And it's Kenaita Hara full. So uh, that was Mordechai's credit. I remember the, uh, uh, the reform, I guess it was a reform, sh- was from synagogue where BMG now is on the 11th over there. There's always a big bingo sign on Route 9 Monday nights. Yeah. So uh, it was night activity for the town, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> and w- did you get like, a lot of phone calls from other yeshivas saying, like, how do we build a building? What do we do? Well, people still, a lot of people do call if, if they're newer and all. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration between yeshivas. Shiva's Kailam is a tremendous amount. It's an informal network, but it's a, a tremendous amount of collaboration. So I'll never forget that we helped open a Kailam Boca. My dear friend, uh, Reb David May, was the driver behind it and uh, with Reb Nachi, and they were building a Kailam there. And they had a zoning question. They never dealt with zoning. I mean, we dealt with zoning all the time. So I said, send, if you ever send me the address, send me the address, I look up the zoning code, and I see that in that building, although it's zoned commercial and they don't really allow synagogues, they do allow reading clubs and, and reading rooms, libraries, and, and reading and clubs. So I called up Dove and I said, Dove, listen, what are you really doing? You're not, a, you're, not a, a, you're not a college, you're not a school, you're not an elementary school. You're a place for, you, for people to come and learn. So maybe, you, maybe you'll fit in the definition of a club, of a reading room or a club. So... Uh, he called the zoning officer there. He says, you know, I think we, we fit under this. The guy said, no problem. And that was how they were zoned. Do you have it down to science? Yeah, you, learn, like... <laughs> you learn a few tricks along the way. What was your day-to-day like? Was there, was there a typical day? Uh, you, try to try, you try to stay structured because, you know, there's repeated, repeating tasks that you need to do. Uh, but you're also always looking at the things that are not on your plate that should be on your plate. That's pretty important is to anticipate or try to anticipate the things you need to do that are not immediately in front of you. All right. Is there anything that we missed? I think you're a great interviewer. You should have a lot of atzacha. And uh, to, the, to the audience out there, just love your Lakewood. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Our Town Podcast. Wow, what a phenomenal person, Rabbi Aaron Cutler. The conversation was loads of fun. I hope you enjoyed that. Please remember to rate our podcast, five-star review, and let your friends and family know about this podcast. To sponsor one of our episodes and help us continue, it's OurTown at LNNews.com. To hear about upcoming episodes, send an email to OurTown at LNNews.com. Next week, Sunday, is Cholmoid, for this is the Pesach episode so there will be no new episode on Chalmite, but Sunday right after the Yantif, we'll be dropping another episode with another great guest. So we will catch you after Yantif. But for now, continue being uniquely you. I can't wait to hear your story someday.